Well, I will focus on energy and climate change. And many of us feel or think and don't really want to admit or say to our friends and family that it may be the case that we're already too, already too late. It may be the case that the Copenhagen failure has pushed us beyond the point of very high risk. So what are we to do? Meet every year and discuss what we should have done, what could still be done, and focus on adaptation rather than prevention? Well, we just simply don't have any choice. We simply have to keep doing everything we can to, if not stop, mitigate the climactic events that are coming towards us. Now in North America, we live in Quebec, in the northeastern corner, on a continent that overall lacks, has lacked, the political will to really embark on the necessary changes that we've all been advocating for decades. No offense, Mr. Undersecretary. I think it's, it's not news to anyone here. So we in Quebec, of course, we're not a sovereign state, or not yet a sovereign state. Some of us would have liked to be in Rio and in Copenhagen and have the ability to vote like other environmentally friendly nations and try to help tip the balance. We may not have succeeded, but we would have been in the right space, in the right place, and wouldn't, would not have had uh, the burden to go and explain to others that, yes, Canada has had the dinosaur price again today, but we disagree. We in Quebec are not quite the same. We're the green province in a brown country. But lacking sovereignty for now, what can we do? We can lead by example. And there's been a bipartisan willingness in Quebec for decades to be ahead of the pack. Well, at the beginning, we didn't want to be ahead of the pack. We thought that the pack would be there with us. But it didn't turn out this way. And I don't know if Premier Jean Charest is here in the room, but I must salute him and his commitment to environmentally friendly policies while he was in power. Uh, my party, the Parti Québécois, had begun before, and now that we're back in power, we're pursuing these, these energy and environmental policies. So what can we do in North America? Well, we've been there a bit before. California, Quebec, and a couple of other provinces and states had the good idea about a, a decade ago that emission standards for cars should be lowered significantly. And that was a major issue. And of course, it's a bit odd that a state and a province would act alone. But since the two federal governments would not act, we decided to do so. And some other states and provinces did the same. And in the end, we more or less shamed Ottawa and Washington into adopting these standards all over North America. So we're at it again. California and Quebec, January 1st of this year, have started the first cap and trade system in North America. Now, we wish not to be alone in this. Uh, other states and provinces had signed the Western Climate Initiative a few years back, and we hope that Ontario and maybe Washington states would be the first ones to follow, and then others. One of the reasons is that it provides uh, significant revenue for states that embark on the scheme. We think about half a billion dollars uh, for Quebec within five years, and for Quebec, half a billion is a large number. For California, it's going to be much larger, of course. And we say, well, maybe we'll uh, be able to shame Washington in Ottawa into adopting a continent-wide cap-and-trade system. And in the path towards that, we think that Quebec and California will link up with Australia. Now, another country wants to link up with California and Quebec, and maybe some of the cap-and-trade systems in Europe. So at some point, it will become a bit odd that we have an international cap-and-trade system without the two governments of North America being into the game. Now in Quebec, some people say, well, it's easy for you. You have lakes and rivers, and you have hydropower, so you're, you're clean, you're clean at the get-go. But still, if we're clean at the get-go, lowering our, our emissions are, is much more difficult than if we had been less clean at the get-go. So 
we had waters and hydropower in 1990. And we grew our GDP by almost 50% since then, but lowered the emissions of our industry by 25%. So that's working from a clean base and lowering your emissions. And now, call us foolish, but we want to reduce emissions by a further 25% by 2020. And now we have to work very hard at that. Cap and trade is one way, but the other way is electrification of transportation. That's the big, big bite that we have to, to, uh, to sink our teeth in. So we have the, uh, the aim of having a quarter of our cars electric by 2020. Now that's tomorrow. Now it's, it's huge, it's bold, but we're already a little above target in the way to get there. We have the objective of having 95% of our public transit electric by 2030. So that's huge. It's going to help us in many ways to, to lower our footprint in a, in a great fashion. But what it means also for us to be a kind of beacon of environmental policy in North America is to look at other North Americans, many of which want these policies, want them implemented in their states and provinces, and say, listen, it can work in North America. It's not only in Norway that it can work. It can work in North America. It works on the northeastern corner. And even if that doesn't work, I want to make sure, if it's true that we're cooked, or as we say in French, si c'est vrai qu'on est cuit, I want to be on the good side of the conversation with my kids 50 years hence. I want to be on the part of the conversation when I say, we did everything we could. We tried to lead by example. We did everything we could. Now, if you want to blame someone, look elsewhere. It may be small, a small compensation for all this work, but I'd like to be on that side of the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.